Despite the weather, we've had another action-packed day here in Suffolk. With the rain and the wind, the challenges of spring continue for our wildlife. The stars have finally aligned for spineless sai. Our barn owl family have been weathering the storm. And the otters have been causing a stir. Welcome to Spring Watch. Yes, hello, and welcome to Windwatch, <laughs> coming to you from the very gusty Minsmere RSPB Reserve, live up here on the coast of Suffolk. And it's certainly been a blowy day. Top of Snowdonia, 78 miles an hour. Needles off the Isle of Wight, 75. Just up the coast from here, at Gorleston, 53 miles an hour. But even the reserve down here has had its share of the weather. The clouds were scudding very quickly across the sky. There was a huge amount of fisma emanating from the reed beds and the nettles. The fox was deafened by the wind and not hunting the rabbits. And of course, the mere down there was like a bit of the North Sea, actually choppy, I think. Swans were coping, of course. They can deal with that, big buoyant birds. We had a bit of rain as well. No problem for the ducks. Shuffler took advantage of that. And the little egret here is not put off at all, still fishing effectively. I think we can safely say that it was fine weather for ducks yesterday, for ducks. wasn't it? Yeah, it was. very wet and windy. Should we have a look at some of our live cameras? What should we look at first? Tell you what, let's go to the barn owl because we've got this live for the first time. Let's have, this is the exterior here. You can see a little bit of wind and the sun has, uh, has come out this evening. But let's go inside. So this is in infrared. It's dark and deep down in the heart of that hollow tree. And we've got three youngsters there huddled up together it's not particularly cold this evening, but they're not going to want to waste any energy because they are desperately trying to put all of that into growing at the moment. There's no doubt about that. It's still quite early, though, isn't it, in the evening for the adults to be feeding them. So they're, they're quite sort of snuggled down. They're not particularly active yeah, right now. Yeah, in the summer, occasionally, the owl, you know, adult owls will come out earlier in the evening, particularly if they're hard-pressed for food. And then, So we should keep our eyes on them to see if anything does come in throughout the course of the programme. Is our bearded tet in there? Let's have... Oh, it is. Let's have a look at that live. And it's the male sitting look in there. Look at that. A very, very handsome bird. And in fact, they've just swapped over, Chris, because it was the female about five minutes ago when we looked, wasn't it? Oh, honestly, that is fantastic. Very much a bird of this sort of habitat. Last year, we looked at the bitterns, very much a reed bed bird. But of course, these are also known as bearded reedlings. And they are very much at home in this sort of habitat. Look at the moustache, the cinnamon colouring, the grey on the head. People get very, very excited to see a bearded tit, don't they? Best, it's a fabulous best bird, bird so far for me. Best but bird. with the wind and the rain, it was a tough night for many of our nesting birds last night. They all survived, I'm pleased to say. But it was tougher for some than others, particularly the ground nesting birds. The red shank had a sleepless night. It was very agitated, very noisy down there. The gulls, very exposed on that urban rooftop. The chicks were huddled in a corner to avoid the wind and the rain. And these are the long-tailed tits. Now, it's a really fabulously cosy nest. But look. If we highlight that bit, you can see that there's a little bit of damage from the storm where the nest is attached to that bit of branch. This morning we saw four little chicks poke their noses out of, out of that beautiful nest. But it has given us something to worry about, hasn't it, Chris? Because many of those nests are often seen sort of tipped over yeah. or even you can find them on the ground sometimes can't yeah, you? Yeah you can. They are designed to be flexible. They use spiders webs inside that nest to weave it all together and, in, and I remember you know taking old ones which had gone through the process, fledged the young, you know no harm done to the birds and, and having them in the hand they're very squidgy, they are quite stretchy mm. and, 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 and fluffy in that sense but of course if one gusts too far and it tears that and then there's a big sag and then they can tip, tip the young out. Yeah certainly looking a bit precarious so we'll be keeping an eye on those chicks and that nest. So a lot of the birds were hunkered down last night, which is very different to our badgers. They were very much out and about. In fact, it's probably the most active we've seen them in the last week. Now, the reason for this, we think, is that the rain brings the worms out, 
It's not that many worms around here, but they're obviously taking full advantage of any they can find. And the wind washes the insects off the trees. So, as I say, they were out and about foraging. Yeah, I was Great quite to surprised see them. to see that because they don't yeah. like coming out when it's very windy because as they're emerging from their sets, they can't hear any danger. They're very cautious if they're coming out in, in very windy conditions. But, of course, once they're up, they'll take advantage of the moisture, which is also playing a part there. Now, if you've been watching our series so far, you'll know that they're not big and sometimes they're not particularly clever. But our two little sticklebacks, freshwater fish, no bigger than five or six centimetres long, have become the stars of our show. One of them we've nicknamed Frisky Phil. Here he is, he's got a nest down here, and he did really well with the females. He's had quite a lot of females laying his eggs in that nest, and he was very attentive. He was looking after it, everything was going well until it got dark and an otter stamped on his nest. And I'm afraid that when the silt settled, all looked pretty bleak for Frisky Phil. All of his hard work, all of his conjuring magic to lure those females in appeared to be wasted, but he came back as it settled. And what was encouraging was that it appeared that the otter hadn't stamped directly on the nest because then we saw him fanning water through it, oxygenated water, to feed, if you like, those eggs. So Frisky Phil had a bit of a setback, but what about Spine the Sai? If you remember, he was not doing very well with the female sticklebacks at all. He simply couldn't get them into his nest. Things have changed. This was last week. He lures them there, but they have one sniff and skedaddle, quite literally. But look at this. He's pumped himself up, he's got redder, his eyes are bluer. He's still very attentive with that nest of algae, the tunnel that he's made, and eventually he gets this female back, and in she goes. He could have made it a bit easier, but <laughs> she goes in, and then immediately he follows through, he swims through and fertilises the eggs that she's laid, somewhere between 50, maximum 200. But once he's got one success, he just can't stop, it seems. He gets a second and a third female to come in and spawn, and then yet another one. Look at him nibbling her back there. And watch the eggs. You can see the nest expanding as she goes through. Another female, his fifth, comes in. And then, look, it's like, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's a fishy threesome. <gasps> They're queuing up. You couldn't pay for this on the internet. And she goes in, and then look, look at this. He can't wait. He's so keen to fertilise those eggs. He squeezes in with her. She's deposited them, thinks, I'm never coming back here. Off she goes, and look. <laughs> That's brilliant. Quite literally. Quite literally. <laughs> Unbelievably, it doesn't stop there because he finds another female. Here she is at the top of the screen, but watch this, rather than rush in, which is what he was doing last week, he takes it easy. He hangs back, does his little dance, and it works, it pays dividends, because she too comes down to his nest, which is already bulging with eggs. He shows her where it is. She is particularly gravid. Look, she's filled with eggs. She forces our way in. And then watch again, look at the lower part of the nest. You can see the eggs expanding. In fact, they're coming out. Phil can't believe it. He, sorry, sigh, sigh, sigh. He just can't believe it. Look, here are the eggs. That is incredible. And he incredible. goes in and fertilizes them. What about that? Incredible. He's demonstrating absolute elan. What does that mean? And to, uh, that's today's spring word, elan. It's E-L-A-N, and it means vivacity, energy, and enthusiasm. From the original French, a lanceur, to rush forward with a lance. Courtesy of Susie Dent, my friend from Countdown. Wordsmith to the Queen. Well, well perhaps not the Queen. Wordsmith to Queen. She put the Bohemian in Rhapsody. <laughs> 
Yes. I don't know. Let's stop there. Thank you very much, Susie. C can I tell you, Chris, the nation is at home cheering with Elan for Spineless oh, Side. They're up off their seats and they're going, yes, he made it. Well, let's see how he's looking today. He's probably looking extremely pleased with himself. Oh, sorry. This is the live camera. Do you know, I, it's, it's he's, 10 out of 10. He's fanning. He's, he's fanning. Look. He's fanning away. It's almost like he's part of Strictly Come Stickleback, isn't it, it's, really? I mean, it's, he gets top marks from us all. But, Michaela, I've got to say, the job isn't done. He's only really... He's built the nest. That's part one, I suppose. Then he's pumped up his colour and he's got his blue eyes. Then he's done the right sort of dance. And then he's got the females in. Now he's got... Well, it could be anything up to about three or four hundred eggs in there, but he's now got to protect those eggs. And there's a whole mm. host of predators out there that might want to come for those. Other fish, leeches, I've got to tell you, even other female sticklebacks, gangs of female sticklebacks, tattoos, everything, <laughs> will be going in there trying to eat those eggs to get the protein they need to produce their own. And of course an otter. Ottergeddon could happen again. I don't think I could go through that. And, and I mean, you know, he's done a fabulous job, but fingers crossed yeah. that they will turn into little baby... Stickle backlings. Stickle backlings. Stickle I love backlings. that word. Is Stickle that a spring word? No? No? I don't One know. you've it's made up. I just made Probably. up. Probably, yes. Anyway, look, enough of fish. Let's move on to mammals. The UK's mammal fauna doesn't have everything that it should have. We're short of wolves and lynx, the top of the food chain predators. But there is another animal that we're interested in, and we've been given exclusive access to follow its reintroduction to the southwest of England. It's not entirely clear where this small colony of beavers came from, but they're believed to be the first to live and breed in the English countryside for centuries. How the seven or so beavers got into the River Otter may be a mystery. But as they're here, the Devon Wildlife Trust wants to study the impact of their return. But first, the Trust had to prove that the animals were disease-free. So back in March, the beavers were trapped and taken into temporary captivity. I went to meet the team who were charged with testing them. Beaver expert Roisin Campbell Palmer from the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland and specialist vet Romain Pizze. It's huge. So Roisin, here we have a, a sleepy beaver. Why are you doing this? What's the purpose of this work? Because we don't know where they come from, we don't know have these animals been imported directly from Europe, and if so, then there'd be a range of parasites we'd be concerned about. We also don't know species, so we'll also do a genetic test just to check that we've got the right species here. There are two species of beaver. The once native European beaver and its larger North American cousin. Since no one is sure whether the Devon beavers are escapees from a wildlife park or have been released illegally, DNA tests are required, as only European beavers could be allowed back into the wild. About 31 centimetres, which is about, about normal, and about 15 across. So we just measure the dimensions of the tail, and that gives us what it's called a tail fat index. And this gives us some indication of what body condition it's in. Does this look to you like a healthy beaver? This looks like a good, good healthy beaver. It's got quite a thick tail. The interesting thing about this tail is it's, there's been a bite. Oh, it's been bitten? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. this looks like another beaver would have bitten that. Beavers are highly territorial, so they will defend their territory as a family unit. And, and these are absolutely fascinating, these enormous back feet with this, it's lovely and warm actually, but with this webbing mm. here, obviously for, for swimming. Absolutely, so all of the power for um, swimming really comes from the back legs. Now this is very specialised, one of these toes, isn't it? Which one is it? So it's almost like a, it's a split nail. Oh yes. So you see it's very different from the other nails. Uh, this, so it's literally split there and that yeah. they can put the fur in that and it'll give it a really good form. They keep their fur in really pristine condition because uh, it traps air next to the skin so it just keeps stopping them from getting waterlogged. So this is really important. They've yeah. got to constantly groom and groom. Yeah. Can we have a quick look at the beaver's teeth? 
that coloration is uh, through iron oxide in, in their teeth. So, so they've actually got iron in their teeth yeah, to just help to strengthen them. them. They're, they're literally like chisels. Oh I mean, yeah, they look like them. Absolutely, they, they've got you see, metal in them. Very, very sharp cutting edge, and uh, the surface underneath it's the softer material, so it erodes at different uh, rates, so that they always have this very cut, sharp edge. So when those teeth rub together, mm. it's sharpening yeah. all the time. Self sharpening. Self sharpening. Mm -hmm. How do I feel? Yeah, it's easy. Gosh, they are absolutely razor sharp. With the external examination over, the team need to carry out an internal check. So the beaver is prepped for keyhole surgery and its limbs wrapped in foil to help retain body heat. On very rare occasions, beavers may be host to a parasite which can be fatal to humans. The best way to detect its presence is by checking the liver for cysts. So Romaine scrubs up and starts to operate. It's just pushing up against in fact. The first thing that you're seeing there is the liver. Well, that's and you're looking against the diaphragm now. Okay. You can see the heart beating away there through the diaphragm. Oh, yes. So this is the critical bit, though, isn't it? Because you're looking for evidence of this parasite. Are we looking for anything that could look like a tiny cyst? And as far as you can see, Romain, at the moment, there are no cysts on no. the liver here. That's if we go right up to the surface, that's a very nice, normal liver. With this animal getting the all clear, the team checked the other beavers. Well, this is great. There are five beavers here, and so far, they've all got a clean bill of health. But there's one more question that has to be answered before they can be released. Are these actually European beavers? For that, we have to wait for the results of the DNA test. Now, while we were examining those beavers, I'll tell you an amazing thing. We saw that they were actually pregnant. Two of the females were pregnant. You could see the embryos just moving around inside. Anyway, come back tomorrow for the next instalment of our beaver extravaganza. Now, there's another very charismatic mammal here at Minsmere. And if you visited here, you'd have a very good chance of seeing it. But they're unpredictable. They are otters. We think we've got around something like eight otters here at least. Uh, there are two females with two cubs, one female with one cub, and there are probably, we can't be sure, dog otters tracking back and forth here. So this gives us, the number of otters, this gives us a golden opportunity to try to explore the world of these otters. So how are we going to do that? Well, I'm down here about 1.7 kilometres from the main site. Let's have a look at exactly where I am. Let's go up in the air. There's a kind of a channel there, down the middle, a highway that animals move down. There it is. And I'm down the bottom there on the left-hand side, just at the tip there. This is where we are, surrounded by reeds. How do I know that there are otters here? Well, come with me. Let's see if I can show you this. It's a little bit squishy. Can you see there's a sort of a trackway backwards behind me? And if you come down here, there's a perfect, almost perfect otter print here. One, two, three, four, five prints. Uh, there are claw marks, and there's even the, the large pad at the back there. So these are otter prints. They're absolutely everywhere here. This is an otter superhighway. And then they come out, the otters. It's not just the prints. If we come back here... Now, as there were so many otters here, we thought, well, how can we actually see them, go beyond just seeing the prints? And with the help of the Suffolk Mammal Group, we set up this. It's a trap camera. You've probably got one at home. I've got one. And we thought we'd just point it at this area, just here. And we thought, hopefully, we'll see some otters. It wasn't just otters. There were geese moving around, a whole family of them. And here, red deer, a herd of red deer. Where I am now, a muntjac deer. There are loads of muntjac here in Suffolk. We hear them barking at night. Badgers down on this, on this route. And of course, what we're really interested in, the otters, a whole family of them. Four otters in one shot. Here they are having a good old squabble as well. So all of that is going on just here. Now that allows us to ask some questions about these otters. First of all, 
How do they actually communicate with one another? Well, otters do vocalise a lot, and our little camera has picked up some of those sounds. Now, this first sound, have a listen. That's peeping. That's a young otter calling to its mother. Mum, I'm here, I'm lost. Listen to this. This is called huffing. And that's a frightened otter. It seems something it doesn't like and it huffs. And this next one, you can't see, unfortunately, the otters themselves making the sound, but listen. That is called wickering or yickering. And that's probably a couple of young uh, uh, otters having a fight, a tussle, and yickering away with each other. So they communicate by vocalising, but they also, of course, live in a world of smell. And have a look at this. Now, down here, I don't know if you can see it, down there is some sprint. I'm going to pick it up now. Hang on. This is badger of badger. I knew I was going to say that. Otter poo. And you can see it there. Can you see that otter poo? Now, this will contain a whole cocktail of different chemicals that other otters will come down and they will sniff at them and smell them. And it will tell them various messages. One in particular, it's like, this is our place, this is where we feed. So it's a bit like a reserve sign on a, on a restaurant table. Here they come, the otters, and they are sprinting, pooing. And you can see the other otters very, very interested in the scent. It's difficult for us to imagine this world of smell that they live in. But what really surprised me was it wasn't just the otters that were interested in the smell. Look at this fox, that's joining in, adding to the cocktail. Here's a deer, also is interested in the spray. A badger. I know what my dog would have done if it had been down here. She'd have rolled in it straight away. <laughs> OK, so that's what they're doing. This is, this is all about sending scent messages, but of course it's also all about the food that the otters are eating. And that's the next thing we're going to look at, because the remains of what they've been eating are all inside this sprain. So I'm going to put that in here, and I'm going to take this delicious sprain back to the studio, and we're going to examine it under the microscope. And Michaela, I'm going to need your help. Can't wait, Martin. Do you know it's a highlight for me, Chris, of every spring watch, getting my hands and my nose into a bit of poo. Don't ever turn your nose up at poo. I won't turn it's your nose stuff. up. good stuff. I'm very envious. I wish I was mucking in there, quite literally. <laughs> you can join in if you like. Mm -hmm. Now, last night we launched a brand new nest, which we were very excited about. It was our barn owl nest. But the weather last night can be very problematic for barn owls. They're one of the animals that is really affected by wind and rain. That's because when they're hunting, they need to use their ears to pinpoint their prey. Obviously, if it's windy, it's very difficult for them to hear. And they're not entirely waterproof, so rain can be problematic for them as well. So how did last night's weather affect our barn owl family? Well, here are the three chicks. And you can see they're quite agitated, with good reason, because they didn't get fed much last night. Two nights ago, when it was very still, over a four-hour period, they got 12 feeds. Last night, they only got two. You can see they're starting to have a go at each other. They're bickering. They're siblings, and they're getting really annoyed with each other. And then one of the adults comes in. This is one of the feeds. As I say, it did come in with a second feed within four hours, so that meant that two out of the three chicks got fed and one was left without, which is highly likely it's going to be the slightly runty one, the one that hatched last, which is younger and visibly smaller than the other two. And as I said last night, when times are really bad, so that the older one can survive, it often feeds off its younger sibling. So let's hope that doesn't happen. Maybe they're a bit well, old. Well, it doesn't only really take their food, it might eat it as well. That's what I meant. Oh, sorry. OK. That's what I That's meant. That's what I said. But I've got to say, at the moment, these animals are quite large, quite robust, four or five weeks old. So they can go for a period of time without food. They probably go for a couple of nights without food. It wouldn't be too bad. We hope they don't, of course, and we'll obviously be continuing to watch them. You can watch them live now, actually. Not quite 24-7, but throughout the course of the day and the evening, too. Now, Michael, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> are you irritated at all? 
What, by you and Martin? No, not just in a general. Well, well I mean, by you and Martin, you're, you're, you're lovely, but like any man, you're going to irritate me a little bit every so often. You're not now, though. No, 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 you're fine, you're fine. I didn't really mean that. What <laughs> oh. I meant was that the sun is coming down, it's getting dark, and when that happens, there's very often an animal that comes out that can be a right pain. You hear that? That high-pitched whine? That's a sound I know you're familiar with. It's that sound which spoils your barbecue, spoils that late night stroll through the countryside. It's the sound that probably ruined your first ever snog in the bushes. That, that is the sound of a female mosquito. She seeks me out in the dark by sensing the carbon dioxide that I'm exhaling. But if there was another person in here, the mosquito would have a choice of who to bite. So why is it that some people get attacked a lot more than others? That's the question. Dr James Logan at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is studying how mosquitoes select their prey. James, you're suffering for your science. <laughs> Yes, I am. It's a normal day for me, though, to be honest. Yeah, but you're not getting too much sympathy from me because I've already been bitten. But, <laughs> I mean, they are remarkable animals, aren't they? They are. I mean, you can think about them as, you know, nature's ultimate blood-seeking machine, perfectly designed to seek us out, seek our blood, without us even knowing it. OK, so she smelled you using CO2, but then once she's pitched on your skin, she's sensitive to other chemicals as well. That's right, yeah. So as they come in closer to the human body, they start to detect other chemicals. So a lot of people think that BO, body odour, just is a smell, it's just a chemical. But in actual fact, our body odour is made up of around 500 different chemicals, so it's actually very complex. And they detect a, a specific mixture of chemicals that signals that we are human, you know, we are blood. Mosquitoes sniff us out using the antennae on their heads, which are covered in sensitive hairs called sensilla. Odour molecules bind with the sensilla and cause an electrical response in the nervous system. This either draws in or drives off the mosquito. So why do some people attract more mosquitoes? Studies have revealed that every person on the planet has a unique odour signature. It's like our very own smelly fingerprint. And mosquitoes react differently to every signature. Now, Dr Logan has discovered that body odour might not just attract mosquitoes, it can repel them too. What we found is that the reason some people don't get bitten by mosquitoes is because they're producing natural repellents, almost as if their body has a natural defence against mosquitoes. And our recent study has just shown us that this is in fact genetic. So you could pass on this trait for being unattractive to mosquitoes to your offspring. So some lucky people have a gene which makes them repellent to mosquitoes. That's right, yeah. Lucky them. <laughs> lucky them, exactly. Lucky them. There aren't many, many of them, but uh, yeah, they exist. If James can isolate the genes that stop some people getting bitten, it could be the start of a new era of protection against mosquitoes and the many deadly diseases they carry. But what I wonder is how relatively attractive or unattractive to mosquitoes I am, say, compared to my, my colleagues, Michaela, Martin and Yolo. I think it's worth putting it to the test, don't you? I reckon that's a good idea. I think it's a very good idea. <laughs> I start collecting the team's distinct odour signatures. They've been wearing stockings under their socks for the past 10 hours. Nylon is the perfect odour collecting material and our feet, with up to a third of the body's sweat glands, are excellent odour producers. There we are. Right, is yeah, that zip it? Zip him up, zip him up. Okay, up. There we here are. we are. Martin, may I have yeah, yours? Uh, here we are, what you. a fine collection of stinking stockings we've got here. These can all go back then and we'll find out who is positively repulsive to mosquitoes, or who is an attractant to these wonderful insects? 
I took those specimens back and gave them to James in the lab and he conducted a pretty simple experiment. He took them out of each of the packets, put them into a bowl and then he put the bowls on top of a cage filled with hungry mosquitoes. Just to make sure there was no confusion, he put a picture of each one of us on top. And he did this not once but three or four times to put some sort of scientific credibility into the experiment. So there we are, it was simple but it worked and some of the mosquitoes really moved into some of the bowls. Let's just see, shall we, what the results were. In fourth place, most attractive to mosquitoes, I'm very pleased to say, Martin Hughes Games, excellent. In second place, joint second, Chris and Yolo, which means, Michaela, you were most repulsive to mosquitoes. Yes! <laughs> Lucky <And> struck! <laughs> some television presenters. <gasps> no, now you're irritating me. Now you have definitely irritated me. Only occasionally, me. only occasionally. Only but occasionally. that's good. I mean, you know, we've been standing here at some nights and you get bothered by them and I don't. No, I know, but what would be interesting is that you have a, a son, don't you, young, yeah. young chap? We should get him over here and see if you passed on your genes. Let's tie him up to a tree and see how many mosquitoes go. Oh yeah, that's a really great idea. It's my sort of experiment, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I'm really gonna do that to my nine-year-old child, aren't I? Anyway, moving on. Sometimes you can only really appreciate the beauty of behavior of animals when you see it in slow motion. And when you see it in slow motion, sometimes something really simple can be extraordinary when you look at it. Take this black-headed gull, just look at it in slow motion, doing a very simple thing of taking off and flying away from the water. It looks absolutely stunning. It is, it's spectacular. It is beautiful, there's no doubt about that, but what I'm thinking is that because that's showing us something that the human eye can never see, it also gives us an opportunity to look at the behaviour, the physiology, in fact the mechanics of flight. So let's rerun that again and see how the bird takes off from the surface. Well, the first thing is it puts up its wings, but at this stage they're not generating any lift. The thing that's giving it the first lot of lift are in fact its legs. They're about 30 centimetres long and at the bottom they've got those webbed feet and they're pushing into relatively solid mass of water. So it's that that's pushing the bird up into the air. The next stage is this. It produces something called the clap fling. And this is producing a vacuum underneath the wings which quite literally sucks the bird up into the air. It then moves further forward like this and the next stage is to dump any excess weight. It's, it's waterlogged. And as we know, a litre of water weighs a kilogram. This bird could have 250 grams of water. That's about 20% of its body weight on there. So, you know, dumping that water is really, really important. I think I said just 250 grams of water. That would have meant it would never have got off the surface. <laughs> Probably about 25 to 30 grams of water. It's an easy slip, isn't it? But it looks amazing, doesn't it, when it, when it does that, when you see it in slow motion. It's probably something you wouldn't particularly notice no. when you see it at normal speed. And then they go on to beat their wings at a much higher rate. They organise their body. But that getting off the water or getting off the ground is something that birds struggle to do. It's all about the economics of energy. But not all birds manage to do it like that, do Look they? Look at this, a much larger bird, in this case a swan. This bird needs to run across the surface of the water into the wind. It needs wind to generate lift under its wings to get it off, or it just can't be bothered in this case. <laughs> they always look slightly comical, don't they? Other birds which are particularly ill-suited to life on land, but masters of the air, albatross for instance, I read once that an albatross will expend as much energy taking off, the process of running along getting into the air, as it will expend in 15 days of dynamic or slope soaring out over the sea. Really? That's yeah. astonishing. So that little run-up that it has to take yeah. uses a huge, a huge amount, amount of, energy. of energy relative to that that it uses once it's in the air. Well, our cameramen here are certainly getting lots of beautiful wildlife shots, but you can also find beauty in urban areas. Our cameraman, John Aitchison, went out to see if he could find beauty in what appears to be a very industrial setting. This is Teesside, a place called Saltholm, an RSPB reserve. It was used for salt extraction and farm tests with fertilizers. So it's had a very industrial heritage.
It wasn't a reserve until 2008. Already in that time, the reed bed has doubled in area and the wet meadows are getting wetter. It's like an oasis in among the chimneys and the power stations and the cooling towers. This part of the coast is very good for migrants. A group of black-tailed godwits came in this morning. Seeing a quiet place to rest and to feed after migrating is a magnet for birds. The success of this place really is all about food for birds and, and other animals too. When I was a child, I used to see yellow wagtails quite often. But since the 1980s, they've really been declining. And it's largely because they need insects. And you get insects in wet, rough grassland like this. Cattle keep the grass down. Their dung's good for flies. In among the cattle, there's so much food. It's just buzzing with life. One of the best things about this place is the way that the reed beds expanded. And it's that mosaic of edge and places to hide. Water rails are secretive, they skulk. But I've never seen water rails as clearly as here. It's just been brilliant. A lovely looking bird. And a treat, a real rare treat to see one. The other thing that's brilliant in among the reeds is little grebes. He's hunting sticklebacks. And of course, sticklebacks, they're spiky. And the grebe knows that very well and will only eat their heads. So he's got to shake off the, the rest of the fish and leave it behind. This is a wonderful place for a particularly rare duck called the gargany. I've only ever seen a gargany once before. They're really scarce in Britain. There are perhaps a hundred pairs that nest a year. And they're very striking with those big eye stripes and then that chocolate brown on the front. And then they have a kind of comb over on their backs with these long feathers. He's obviously taking a lot of care to make himself look nice. Preening, something that all birds do. Lifting out old feathers that are going to regrow. And they float away. And at this time of year, when the sand martins are nesting, of course, there's a need for feathers to feather their nests. So nothing's wasted. I love just watching the details. Those birds are so beautiful. The shapes they make and the colours and the patterns of them. The fine lines on the gadwall that make it look grey, but in fact the feathers are pale and marked with dark lines. This perfection that there is in ever increasing closeness and detail. This place proves really that nothing's impossible. You, you can make a place attractive to nature really quite easily. In six years, it's absolutely booming with wildlife. I think for lots of people who come here, it's a kind of escape from everyday life, really. It's a, it's a restoration, and restoration is what happens to you as well, if you come and watch wildlife like this, even just for half an hour, it somehow restores you.
Well, connecting with wildlife always restores me. It rejuvenates my soul and completely takes the stress away. It's so important to connect with wildlife every single day. Shall we look at poo? Oh, <laughs> thanks. Let's Bring me back. You brought me back down to earth with a dump. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Good. OK, now this is the sprain that I brought back, but we can't analyse this because it's a bit wet and horrid. So it get, <laughs> tends sorry. to get... Well, not horrid, it's okay. nice, actually. But it, it has to be washed and then dried. And all of these represent one sprain. The contents are one sprain. Wow, look, look, at, look at the that. work all in that, that stuff, Martin, to dry all that out. Amazing to dry it all out. And we have to thank Richard Woolner and Mark Smith, who've done this analysis of all these individual sprains. That is a lot of isn't work, isn't it? Look at the variety the in there. That's incredible. Now, we put some of that stuff under the microscope, mm -hmm. and we can go in close and have a look, if I get this right. Have a look. Now, there's bits of crab shell, bizarre. Oh, my word. Do you see those sort of flowery structures there? Yeah. Those are fish scales. And if we go up, you can see a... Hang on a minute. A vertebra. Got that? Can you see that sort of looking down? I can. It? And as we go fascinating across, fascinating to see it through. It is, isn't it? A microscope. Um, Michaela, do you see those sort of spiky things? Oh those no! Things that look no. a little like. I I think spines. I can guess. Is it from a stickleback? It's from a stickleback, <laughs> yes, it is. But not spineless, I obviously It's not film. spineless, obviously, <laughs> but they're, they're obviously eating stickleback. But we've been able to film all sorts of these things and see exactly what the otters are actually eating. Here we've got bits of a frog. I mean, this sort of detailed analysis. Perch, there's that fish scale. It's sort of really beautiful structure. What's that one? Oh, that's a shrimp. It's a shrimp. The sort of thing you used to love doing as a kid, isn't it? Exactly. Martin? If I, I want to do this, I want this microscope. Look at the, lots it's, of How does it get a crab? crab? That's what I want to know. Let's get down to the sea. Beetle, that's a big meal. It's a huge, it's a worthwhile meal. Bits of pike. Otter eating a pike, that's quite a mouthful. And here, some actual mammal. Absolutely fascinating stuff. But here's the question. We've got two large predators here. We've got badgers and otters. Are they not fighting one another for the same food? Interesting you should ask. I have a graph to show us do this. Do you, Michaela? Martin. I do Goodness indeed. me, what a surprise. And the analysis was done by the Suffolk Mammal Group and Dr Dawn Scott from the University of Brighton. And they took 25 samples of otter and badger poo, which is a, a small sample, but it gives us an idea of what they're eating. And they measured it in percentages. And let me explain that. If you have a look, the blue is the otter, and you look at the fish, in over 90% of the samples, there were fish remains in it. If you look at the badger, look at the plant material, 100% of the samples had plant material in it. Look at the birds though, Martin. I mean, we know both of them will take the birds, but look how low Hardly it is. Hardly any. Hardly any. any at all. So I think basically what this shows us is the ba badger and the otter have a really varied diet. It crosses over a little bit, but they specialise. And the otter certainly specialises in aquatic resources. Fish and even the invertebrates that they found, most of them were aquatic. This is a brilliant example of niche separation. So we've got these two large predators side by side, but because they're eating different sorts of food, they can not compete with each other. I think it's, a, it's a little bit like you and Chris, really, isn't it? I hey? mean, you know, you share the same territory, but there's definite niche separation. And I think it's probably in the, Where are you going with this? In the clothes and possibly what are you the, saying? the it's hair. I don't know. What do you think, Chris? <laughs> Well, I think it's a bit of niche overlap. We're both obsessed with the history of the Second World War as well, you know, so, yeah, a fair amount of that. If you were watching our Spring Watch at Easter a couple of months ago, you'll know that we launched the Big Spring Watch in conjunction with the Woodland Trust. What we wanted was for you to tell us about signs of spring, the first time you saw a swallow, when the oak first broke its buds. Tonight, though, we're going to be looking at the orange tip butterfly. Now, this is not necessarily the first butterfly you see in spring. Those which overwinter as adults, tortoiseshells, peacocks, brimstones, might come out first. But this is the one that emerges from its pupae first. I'm pleased to say that 4,463 people sent in reports, which has enabled us to map the chart of this insect's emergence across the country. The first one was seen in Gwent on the 1st of March, but after that, we had to wait until April as they spread up north. By the 17th of April, just about level with Oxford, then the 20th it was Manchester, the 23rd Newcastle, and by the 28th of April they'd got into southern Scotland.
So the speed of movement, if you like, the speed of emergence of this insect, perhaps the speed of spring, as far as this species is concerned, moved northward at about 53 kilometres per day, 33 miles per day. Now, in isolation, this doesn't mean very much at all. But the good news is that we've got 30 years of data for this going backwards. So we can contrast the results that we get this year with all of those to see if spring is advancing more quickly. And we'll be doing that in later programs. The orange tip as a species is definitely on the move. It's, it's moving northwards. Its distribution is changing. It does now occur in Scotland. It didn't used to. And we'll be finding more out about the orange tip in Unsprung tonight. I'm very pleased to say we're going to be joined by Matthew Oates. He's a lepidopterist, a man who studies butterflies and moths of great repute and he'll be here to tell us about that on Red Button and on the web. There's always some good news when it comes to conservation, but sadly, of course, there's often a lot of bad news as well. And there is one group of insects which we're terribly fond of that are in massive trouble. Bumblebees. Loved by gardeners up and down the country, these pollinating machines play a vital role in the growing of our plants. There are 27 species of bumblebee native to the UK, and six that you're likely to see in your garden. But they're all in trouble. Since 1970, the UK's bumblebee population has fallen by 60%. So what's the problem? Many non-native or cultivated garden flowers are the wrong shape for our bees, and some produce no pollen or nectar. The long grass bumblebees need to build a nest is kept short on overly manicured lawns. And since 1930, 95% of wildflower meadows, prime habitat for bumblebees, have been lost. We're sending out a Springwatch SOS and we need you to come to the rescue. We certainly do need you to come to the rescue and there's very simple things that you can do. If you have a garden, plant wild flowers. That will really help your bees. You need to plant them early in the season so that the queen bee, when she comes out of hibernation, has something to eat. And then you need to keep planting them for the rest of the season. Sort of things are lavender, foxglove, white clover. Those sort of things are good, aren't they? Yeah. And a little tip, um, if you go down to your local garden centre, don't get the most sort of glossy, glamorous plants. Just stand still and watch and see which plants the insects are going to. And those are the ones to put in the garden. Good tip, Good Martin. tip, good, good tip. tip. Another tip is to build them a little bee home. And this is the sort of thing that's suitable for most of the bees that you'll find in your garden. Dig a hole and then put an upturned pot into the hole. Underneath the pot, you want to put something that they can nest in. So put some old straw, or if you've, if you've got any rabbits or guinea pigs or something, um, get old bedding out. Pigs in as well. No, the old bedding. Oh, I'm sorry, I think maybe put a so rabbit silly. in there. You know. That's and quite big, Mick, isn't it, really? That's and, a big hole. And then you put, um, you put something on top, if it's got a hole in, so the water doesn't go in. But then, this is the clever bit, you want to put a little bit of hose pipe underneath it so this one's not very bendy, it's gone a bit I'll stiff. It, I'll hold it, I'll hold it, I'll hold it. My pipe's gone stiff. Um, you want to put it under there and you yes. want to poke it out of the top and that's where they come down and then they find their nest. And it's amazing because you do see them, don't you, Martin? They sort of buzz around and they, they look for little holes they in do. the ground. They do. I've been following nesting. one in the back garden. She's nesting in a wall. I've seen the whole process. She, she went out and looked for the right place. She's in there and she used to come back every evening, taking her time. And now there's loads and loads of, of you know, her offspring are coming out. There's a whole season going on just in a hole in the wall. Fascinating to watch. Brilliant. And of course, you can get information of how to do that probably better than I've just done it on our website. All the details are on the website. We can. Let's go from the warm coziness of your back gardens and plunge into the freezing cold waters of the Orkneys. Yola Williams is on the march. Orkney has a stunning coastal landscape which supports a huge variety of fauna and flora. But it isn't just above the surface that wildlife can be found. Below, there's a hidden world of incredible diversity.
Now, when I said I was coming up to Orkney for Spring Watch, lots of my friends said, Yolo, you have got to go snorkeling. So I've enlisted the help of marine enthusiast Penny Martin, and she's brought me to the very best place for it, Scapa Flow. When most people think of Scapa Flow, they don't tend to think of the wildlife, but of the wrecks. During the First World War, the British Navy based itself in Scapa Flow. Coastal defences were built to protect its fleet from attack. One strategy was to use block ships, old vessels sunk between some of the islands to prevent access into the harbour. At the end of the war, the battleships surrendered by the German Navy were moved here. On the 21st of June 1919, a misunderstanding prompted the Germans to sink most of the fleet. A total of 52 ships went down to the seafloor. Scapa Flow now has one of the largest concentrations of shipwrecks in the world. Not only are they an impressive sight, they're enhancing the marine environment by providing a home for many species of aquatic life. This tiny nudibranch or sea slug is only a few centimetres long. Nudibranchs are found in seas worldwide, but this beautiful species prefers the colder waters of the North Atlantic. It's thought that this species of sea hare varies in colour depending on its diet. These adults are dark because they feed on brown algae close to the shore. Juveniles feed on red algae in deeper waters, and so a more russet in colour. From the surface, I thought Scapa Flow looked dull and lifeless. How wrong I was. The shipwrecks have created huge man-made reefs providing shelter for a wonderful array of wildlife. Penny, I've got to say, that was fabulous. Fabulous. I mean, we didn't go deep at all, and yet we saw such a diversity of wildlife. It was amazing. Yep. No, no, we always see lots whenever we go in the water, but it's different every time. Now, you want to show me something else? You've got these in your hand. What exactly is that? This is a, the egg case of a flapper skate. They're hatched. You can see that they're, they're empty. And flapper oh, skate... Oh, what? A flapper, flapper skate? Flapper skate, yeah. They used to be called common skate, and they used to be common all the way around the coast of the UK. But they're really, really rare now. They're now classed as critically endangered. You've probably seen ray cases, which yes. are about this size. These are much more common. But these are from flapper skates, which are the largest skate in the world. Now, you say it's big. I mean, you, you know, if the egg case is that fish. big, how big's the fish? <laughs> the biggest skate in the world. It's about two and a half metres from wingtip to wingtip. So two and a half metres is about as high as, as high I can as reach that. And that would that's be yeah, huge. That's right, yes, they're really big. And they're sometimes seen when we're diving. You usually have four or five sightings a year. Oh, Penny, that is absolutely stunning. Thank you very much for bringing those along. I think there's a lesson there for all of us, isn't there? We should follow Penny's advice. Get in the water, just put your face in. You never know what you'll see. There's such a variety in there. So go on, get off that armchair, get in the sea. Great. Now, massive thanks to the Orkney Skate Trust for that. They helped out. And if you find any of those giant egg cases, they really want to hear from you. And you can get all the details of how to get in contact on the website. Never seen anything like that myself. No, no. Massive. Huge. Two metres. What an extraordinary thing. fish. Fantastic. Extraordinary, extraordinary thing. Is Have a mean? listen to this. Have a listen. It's a sound that a lot of people hear when they come here to Minsmere. It's a frustrating sound because you often hear it, but
but it's very, very difficult to see the bird. But what is it? It is a Chetty's warbler, and we've got a camera on a nest. It's a first for us. Here we are. The nest is low slung and deep cupped, as many of these sorts of birds' nests are. It's down there, just a few centimetres above the ground in the root of this gorse and reeds, quite well hidden. And you can see what well, is probably the female on the nest there, because the eggs have hatched, and just like the wren, which we were watching last week, it's the female that does most of the feeding of the chicks. Only on 20% of occasions have they ever seen males coming in. And here we are, this is the live picture. Is this picture. live now? And there's that female snuggling down there. They Fantastic. used to be quite rare, didn't they? I mean, they, they, they did, weren't yeah. here at all until... They weren't. They, 70s. They were 73. 73. 73. I found the first nest, right. I remember finding my first nest in 1975 at the did sewage you? works yeah. near Eastleigh. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> Because they've got lovely little red eggs. Amazing, red like eggs. brick red eggs. I was so excited to see them. And they hatched out and it had five young and it was a big moment. And how many now? Don't they reckon it's about 2,000 males? 2,000 males? Yeah. 2,000 so males. That... Maybe may more females. But yeah. the thing is, they, really, they, they suffer when we have cold winters. The last couple of really harsh winters that we had definitely knocked them back. But they're here to stay. They've colonised, there's no doubt about that. Because that sound is it's shatteringly loud, isn't it? You can't yeah. A tiny bird that big. It's, it's, like, it's astonishing. It's five astonishing. seconds wow. of absolute row. Yeah, it it reminds me of a, a vaccine <laughs> song. You know, something like is that. It? Yeah, <laughs> all the damned. <laughs> New rows. It's just in a bush, loud. I like that. <laughs> it's not the carpenters, is it? Let's face it. Let's should we have a look out. at some of the live cameras? I think we should have a little check in on our blue tits. Ten little chicks mm. sitting in this nest box. Oh, yeah, they are getting scratch. bigger by the day and they are due to fledge pretty soon. I doubt they'll fledge this evening. They're, no. they're not quite ready, plus the fact that it's very windy. They're, they don't like to fledge in this sort of weather. Um, but they seem to still be doing well, I'm pleased to say, mm. because a lot of blue tits aren't around the country. Should we have a look at the... Oh, bearded oh, tit. Bearded tit. Let's have a look at the bearded tit. tit. She's in. The mother's in. Yeah. That's the female. That's the female now. That's... I hate to tell you, but oh, I know. the Just male has ago. been in there. The chicks have been showing their open mouths oh, with their little white spots. Oh, We've got more of that to come. It's going to be fascinating watching these bearded tits. Another spring watch first and a very, very special bird. Do you know, just, um, well, five minutes ago, we saw the barn owls feeding. Let's have a look at that. One of the adults came in. Here are the chicks. We were saying last night they only got, well, two feeds recorded in four hours. Hopefully tonight will be a bit better. It's still a little bit windy, but I don't think it's quite as dramatic as it was last oh, night. Oh, oh, look at that! But here we go. Let's say that happened about five minutes ago. Oh, you get a beautiful shot of the face there, don't you? Just look at that. Do you know what, Michaela? When I was down in the reeds looking for the otter, there was a barn owl quartering just down where we were looking for food. I wonder Could if it was the same that. one. But it was lo looking for food against the grey of the sky, the sunlight slanting in. We've just got time to show you one last thing before we go. Take a look at this. This is our iron mouse challenge, occupied by a squirrel, and suddenly it gets spooked. <laughs> <laughs> And unfortunately, <laughs> it takes a drenching. <gasps> then, look at this. What I like is it tries to pretend it hasn't happened. <laughs> so like when you trip over something and the, when you're walking down the street. <laughs> Dripping. It's oh, absolutely fantastic. fantastic. It's a good time. Good to have a laugh at the end of the programme. It, yeah. <laughs> it is the end of this programme, but coming up now, we've got Unsprung on the red button and online. I'm going to be speaking to Pete Hill from Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, all about lizards and snakes and active conservation in the UK, so stay tuned for that. Now, what have we got for you tomorrow? Well, our beaver story continues. What is going to happen next? Will they get out and about? We'll give you the next chapter of A Tale of Two Sticklebacks, Spineless Sai and Frisky Phil. And of course, we'll be keeping our eyes on those barn owls, counting the number of items that are brought in, seeing how effective that is. Now, don't forget, tomorrow morning, 7 o'clock, Brett Westwood will be there for the early morning show. Do tune in for that, if you possibly can. On the red button. On the red and button online. and on the web. It <laughs> gets me right. Anyway, and we'll be back tomorrow night, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye.